not be doing of any sort. And so I do not believe that the Railroad Commission should be an advocate for oil and gas or for any industry. I just don't believe that's a proper role of government. Uh, as Railroad Commissioner, I would totally disavow uh, that third one, even though it's on the website, maybe it's even in statute. There's absolutely no reason for Railroad Commissioners to support the most powerful industry in Texas. The Railroad Commission has a budget of maybe $85 million a year. That's a teeny, tiny oil company. What could they do, possibly, for oil and gas anyway? Uh, they need to just do their job and regulate uh, the activities that are appropriate for them to, to regulate. And uh, your, your thoughts, Martita? Well, my mission as for Railroad Commissioner is to get the commission back to its original intent that the legislators and Governor Jim Hogg intended back in the 1800s, which is for it to be the advocate, the supporters of private citizens and small business, which the commission has really, really stepped away from. There is no reason a billion dollar industry in this state needs to have this, this much support. The citizens need to be protected. Their private property rights need to be protected. And, and, and do, you, do you think, uh, we'll go back to you, Mark, um, in terms of, you know, you say the, the actual definition of, of, of the commission should be changed, um, but in, in terms of adhering to the definition that they set out for themselves, this dual, dual mission, do you feel like the current commission is fulfilling that in any way or coming close? Well, they are certainly advocating for the industry. Uh, there's no question about that because if you go hear them talk, uh, and I've, we've heard some of them very recently, they will talk about our industry. And I'm thinking, whose industry are you talking about? You work for the state of Texas. You don't work for the oil and gas industry. They will openly talk about it. So they're doing that. There's no question about it. Um, the issues around public safety, they do a reasonably good job. There are some uh, quibbles that I would have uh, with them or th around things like earthquakes that we'll talk about uh, a little later. Um, and as far as, what was the first one again? Oh, uh, the, the first one was our stewardship of natural resources and environments. That, that actually yeah. is probably the role they fulfill best. Um, and uh, if, you, if you read the history of the Railroad Commission, what they did uh, starting really with the uh, discovery of the East Texas field, that was a seminal event in oil and gas in Texas. Um, and there were some really interesting and serious issues that cropped up after that. And it's really not so much stewardship of the natural resources, which is important, but it's the protection of private property owners' access to those natural resources. And that's really the fundamental thing that they have done in the past that, that I'll, I'll give them credit for. They're behind the times those regulations in place need to be changed and updated, but they, they've actually done a reasonable job of, of, of stewarding the natural resources. And, and, and we'll get to um, private property issues in a little bit, but I wanted to ask you, um, Martina, I mean, obviously in, in sort of your opening statement, you, you said you, you don't feel like they're um, fulfilling, um, it sounds like even, even that mission they, they, they set forth, um, but uh, do, do you think that the Railroad Commission is doing any part of that well right now, or is it kind of need all, all, all to be changed in your mind? For me, as a Texas citizen, and as a representative for ordinary citizens, citizens um, part of the natural resources is not just oil, it's water and air. And they don't seem to be concerned with the issues that uh, rural communities and even urban communities are having in protecting those resources. So we can't bring back um, clean water if you've already contaminated it. Um, and you can't um, reverse the process once a child uh, starts getting sick from uh, the air and the pollutants that are in the the pollutants that are in the environment now that are caused by either the fracking um, operations or even the refinery operations. So I don't think they've done a very good job in um, protecting our resources overall. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask to um, you know Mark, you're you're a petroleum engineer, um, so you're kind of coming at this you know sort of scientifically, but you know, you also have your views on various policies. Um, how do you view your role as a, your, your experience as a petroleum engineer going into this job? You know, there are people who are cynical about, you know, uh, I, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the Republicans will tout their experience if they have it with the, um, uh, with the industry, and then others are sort of cynical about someone from the industry going in to regulate. Um, how, how do you view your experience um, going into this job? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question, Jim, because, um, as a petroleum engineer, uh, most people will, 
probably automatically be suspect of my intentions with regard to the Railroad Commission because so many oil and gas people sort of blindly support the Railroad Commission. Um, I don't. Anyone who's, who's read my book, if you don't have it, and we have them up out there for a donation, um, will know that I've been pretty critical of the Railroad Commission. In fact, uh, I'll tell you a quick story without revealing who it was, but I sat next to a person at a recent hearing who was the governmental affairs uh, representative for a, a very large major oil company. And she said two things to me that were very interesting. One was, sounds to me like what you're proposing is a lot of tough love. And I said that would be not a bad way to put it. And the other thing she said was, at least from the standpoint of the major oil companies in Texas, we really can't have a railroad commission that people distrust. So I understand as a petroleum engineer, people may say, well, you know, can we trust you? Are you really just a you know, wolf in sheep's clothing? People are going to have to look and, and look at me and see what I have to say and, and uh, what I've written to understand that, especially as a libertarian, our viewpoint is everybody has rights. Property rights on the subsurface are not any different than those on the surface. And a lot of the issues around oil and gas are the fact that we've allowed subsurface rights to dominate over surface rights. And this has allowed the industry to do things that most of the companies don't do. It's really a few companies that usually create the problems. My experience as a petroleum engineer actually puts me in the best position of being able to work out those compromises about how can we protect everybody's rights going forward. We don't want to destroy the oil and gas business in Texas, of course not. But we do want to protect people's water. We do want to protect people's property rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, M Martina, my question for you is, um, you know, you, you're, you're obviously passionate about protecting water, air, um, and all that, and kind of coming at this, it sounds like you kind of want to sort of tilt what you see as an unbalanced um, regulatory um, system right now that's balanced more towards, you know, protecting the company's interests. I mean, how, how do you, um, since, since you haven't worked in the industry, do you feel like that provides you with a fresher perspective for how to do this as an outsider. Um, but I, I also wonder if, if, if that would be a challenge as well, kind of coming in since you didn't have you know, the industry experience. For me personally, I don't think that would be much of a challenge for me. I actually do have a Bachelor of Science in Civil Technology mm -hmm. in Construction Management. I could have easily gone and worked into the oil and gas field. Mm -hmm. It's a bit, a bit of a learning curve, but it's not much more than someone that was a career politician, such as the current chairwoman, and someone that was a CPA, which is um, the outgoing commissioner. So if a CPA can easily become a commissioner, I don't see what problem I would have becoming a commissioner, especially since I'm coming from the standpoint of ordinary citizens need to be able to trust the commission. And really, there's no trust in the commission once since everybody that pretty much passes through this office is either uses, as, uses it as a stepping to stone either into a higher position or going straight into the oil and gas uh, lobbying firms or even um, private companies. So uh, real quick, you mentioned the stepping stone. Uh, a, a lot of, um, there have been issues in the past with uh, commissioners, you know, not staying. It's a, it's a six year term, it's a, it's a long term. Um, you know, not staying the full term. Would you, would you stay all six years if, if you're Yes, elected? I would. And uh, Mark, all six? Uh, there would be no other office I would aspire to at this point. <laughs> in six years, I'll be ready to actually retire <laughs> instead of, as my wife said, and she's shaking her head over there, no, we wouldn't. <laughs> uh, but yes, I would absolutely stay all six years. Okay. And, and uh, Martina, you know, I, I, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, you pointed out that, that not everyone on the commission right now, you know, well, uh, was a petroleum engineer or, or, or so forth. Do you feel like would you prefer a commission that has more perspectives then? I mean, um, in terms of, you know, maybe one commissioner with, with you know, engineering or, you know, oil and gas experience, you know, and one, you know, maybe with, with your experience, that type of thing, do you feel like the need to have a sort of a balanced um, a set of people with balanced backgrounds in the commission? Or, or do you kind of feel like, would you much, much just prefer, you know, a commission of, of uh, three Martina Salinas's, I guess? No, not at all. Um, I don't th I think uh, in general society um, benefits when you have different perspectives going on. This is why we have 
all these different uh, political parties now because we don't agree with the current two-party system. So I think um, either whether it's no oil and gas people or an all ordinary people or one oil and gas person, um, I think it could work either way. I think it really, it, it really is up to uh, Texas citizens to decide who they want, but they need to be able to hear our voices first. And especially, I mean, the current, uh, the recent elected official is actually a mechanical engineer. So he really, he, he deals with processes. He doesn't really deal with the actual petroleum engineering side. Right, and, and I, think, I believe he, he was telling himself as the first engin engineer at all on the commission in 50 years. So it's, it, it's pretty rare for the commission to actually have someone with the, the, the very deep technical oil and gas experience like that. Um, he doesn't have that deep in oil and gas experience. Uh, he, he, he was a uh, subsurface facility person. Uh, most of the issues facing, the technical issues facing the Railroad Commission are in the subsurface. There's very little, the only part that's on the surface is pipeline safety. Those issues are very, very, very different. And so although I agree with Martina that some broad-based perspective is needed, the reality is a lot, a lot of what the Railroad Commission does is about very highly technical issues. And I'm afraid we have commissioners who don't understand enough, and they're having to rely on underpaid bureaucrats to tell them what to do. And I don't think that they're always serving the, the people of Texas properly. I was at a hearing about the Railroad Commission not long ago, and they were complaining about, the legislature was complaining about how low the salaries were for people at the Railroad Commission. Uh, a lot of the technical people make forty or $50,000 a year, at least up till the boom, BS graduates in petroleum engineering were making $100,000. So who are you going to get to serve on the Railroad Commission except people that are not very technically competent? And I think not that they're not well-intentioned, and you don't have commissioners that know any different. And so what they do, they'll override things like the, and I'm sure we're going to get to the earthquake question in just right, a minute. Right, yeah. They'll override uh, people around the state that know better. And uh, since, since you brought it up, I mean, that, that has been a, a big issue. I mean, maybe not just the Railroad Commission, but it is probably one of the more highly technical agencies out there. And you're right, you know, the, the, the salaries are, are, are far lower than what you'd get on the oil fields, although a lot of folks are getting laid off from the oil fields right now. Um, I'm wondering, both of you, Mark and Selena, I, is there an answer to that? Do you just ask for more money to get, you know, to be able to pay more and, and get, get more qualified people or people that aren't overworked? Or is, is there an answer to it? My recommendation uh, is that less of the technical work needs to be done in-house. Technical work needs to be done by consultants. We have a deep, deep, deep bench of oil and gas people in this state. There are, the, if the, the expertise, the worldwide expertise exists right down the road in Houston, all right? And so th to me, the answer is the, the people at the commission should be overseeing work done by people outside the commission where the real experts are where we can get ex answers that we can actually believe are technically competent. What do you think, Martina? Well, having worked in uh, local government the past eight years, my concern is that um, contracts always go to the lowest bidder. So you're not always going to get the most qualified people. I always, I always, I do believe that government could succeed if they have enough funds. And I would even be willing to cut my own salary if I was a commissioner. Because I, I, I think it's the current trend that people higher up get paid more, a lot more than they should, when um, they could sacrifice a little and people who are actually doing the work can, uh, will benefit greatly from any increase. They're trying to get the geoscience vote here. Um, they're probably applauding that. Um, so, so one, it's, it, it's a wonky thing that's, that's going on, but it's really important when you're talking about the Railroad Commission um, the, the agency is about to undergo uh, what's called the Sunset Review. Um, some of you might be familiar with it, but it's basically every few years, different state agencies will undergo this process where a panel um, will basically uh, uh, consider if, if the agency is doing its job, sort of evaluate everything. Is it spending money well? Is it fulfilling its mission? Um, and then come up with recommendations for the legislature to then vote on, and the legislature is, is supposed to incorporate them in, into a bill, and it's 
Um, supposed to be the case where if the bill doesn't pass, then the agency could potentially shut down. But the, the Railroad Commission has undergone this process a, a few times in a row where uh, none of the recommendations have been passed um, and, and somehow through legislation the, the agency has, has survived. So this is, um, you know, going into the 27, 2017 session, this is what the uh, agency is going, going to go under again, and there's a lot of cynicism, you know. Will, will there be major changes? Um, so last time the, the uh, agency went through this process, um, the, uh, the Sunset Review Committee came back with, with uh, the following recommendations. Um, they included um, uh, that, that they would change the commission's name um, to, to something that, that it actually does, um, r rather than the Railroad Commission, um, shorten the period in which commissioner, commissioners can fundraise, um, bar commissioners from accepting contributions from parties with business before the commission, um, expanding its recusal po policy, um, for, for those instances, and requiring um, commissioners to resign before running for another office. Um, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Martina, first. Um, would you support um, any of those, all of those? Um? All of the above? Yeah. Uh, especially since the, the first one is really critical, since um, everybody out in Texas thinks that there's, you know, it's railroads that you're over, and it, it hasn't been in, what, a decade? Decades. Uh, decades. And um, I do believe that for any person that's in public office, if they're going to run for another office, they really do need to resign. There should be no backup plan for them. If you're going to go for it, you might as well go for it all the way. And um, we also have the fundraising yes. issues. Yes, oh, of course, the fundraising mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, especially as part of the Green Party, um, we don't accept any corporate facts. I think that's a big issue. I'll, if you look at the previous uh, candidates, especially on the Republican side, a lot of their money comes from oil and gas. So if you have a lot of money coming from that industry, you're very, uh, you're tied to them or else you're not gonna get money from them again. So when you get money from local people, from grassroots, it's when you're actually free because you're respond, you are, res you are only responsible to the citizens of Texas. You're not responsible to any corporation which has their own agendas. How about you, Mark? If the citizens of Texas knew that their legislature was against those common sense changes, they would be appalled. They would be absolutely appalled. They are so obvious as things that we need to do. I don't get it, except I made the observation not too long ago that the Railroad Commission is probably the only regulatory agency that Republicans like. And um, I was corrected. There's one other one that Republicans like, and that's TABC. And of course, um, that's not really that good a company. But um, I, I just don't get it. There are powerful forces within the legislature that are holding that stuff up. There are red herrings being talked about. It's, these things are always killed in committee. They never make it to the floor. And I mean, changes that have been proposed by Republicans, not by Democrats, not by Libertarians, not by Green Party candidates. They're Republicans, and there are powerful forces, some of which are from uh, Midland, Texas, whose daughter sits on the Railroad Commission, frankly, uh, that have prevented these things from, from happening. And um, so, um, since you both have, have uh, agreed changing the commission's name, um, what, what should it be called, just uh, before we move on? Um, there have been a number of suggestions. The one I like the best is Texas Energy Resources Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, some have suggested Texas Energy Commission. Um, that's okay, but I didn't like it because it would actually continue to deceive voters into thinking it had something to do with wind and solar and nuclear and other things, and it doesn't. It really only has to do with oil and gas and coal. Right. And how about you, Martina? Uh, yeah, I would lean towards the resource. I would actually put it out to probably a resolution so people could have their voice. I don't know, make it an online survey. Make it simple. Yeah, and, and, I, and I guess, uh, and I should say, one of the arguments against this, uh, a whole bunch of people have, have proposed renaming the commission, and it, it seems like there's um, a, a pretty vast majority that, that, that want to do this. Um, th those who resist it say that they, um, um, that it would require a constitutional change in the Texas Constitution, that would be cumbersome. Um, and also, um, there's this issue about whether the EPA would 
decide to then sort of con reconsider delegating, uh, reconsider the authority that they delegated the commission because of the name change, which the EPA has pretty much more or less said that they wouldn't. But do you, you don't have any concerns Th about there, this? There is one more concern you're going to hear during this election cycle from one of the Republican candidates, which is that it'll cost too much money to change the letterhead. Right. Um, and, um, and it actually probably would, it would cost some money. I, I, don't, I haven't gotten a figure on that. But. Yeah. So why would we not spend taxpayer money on good government? I don't know. I, that's just, uh, that one's crazy. Dip into the rainy day fund. That was being funded by oil and gas severance taxes. Take some of those severance taxes and buy some new stationery, for God's sake. Um, um, the, the EPA thing, I, I actually, during the last legislative session, uh, was in some discussions with someone who had some connections to the EPA. Uh, there were some attempts to get the EPA to issue a letter that would say, no, we wouldn't upset the thing. They would not do it uh, for some reason. I don't, I don't know why they would not do it. And so this thing continues, yeah. continues thing to hang was, around. Yeah, that thing was interesting. Um, there was an EPA regional director who issued a letter that said, we're pretty sure this isn't an issue, but then those opposed um, said that they wanted it from D.C. To, to absolutely be sure. We got some really good lawyers in the state of Texas. I think they could figure that out. I, I just say use the stationery until it runs out and then get some new stuff <laughs> with a new label. I mean, it's pretty simple. I, and I knew that was coming up. I knew that was coming up. Um, great. Uh, well, well, moving on, um, I, I, I think we, we sort of touched on this, but um, I did want to sort of reestablish the fact that we are in a, a, a pretty rough for, for oil producers downturn. Um, you know, lots of layoffs. Um, I, I think Chevron just announced uh, 655 more layoffs in, in Houston um, yesterday. Um, I'm wondering, uh, it hasn't gotten a, a lot of attention, but um, there's an interesting history at the Railroad Commission where back in the day, back in the, the, the 20s, 30s or so, when there was the oil glut in, in East Texas, uh, the, the commission um, basically uh, uh, used the, the tool called pro-rationing, and, and it was a very a very strange, interesting part of our history where there was martial law declared, but they, they, they limited the amount um, that uh, could be pumped from, from different wells, and it was partially to reduce waste, but also to, um, you know, lower, pr uh, to, to raise prices by lowering supply. Um, Mark, do you, do you think that's even, should, should there even be a discussion about the tools that the Railroad Commission has to address supply? Well, the short answer is no. But if you look at the history, what's really interesting is they, they didn't actually say they were reducing supply. What they said was they were regulating the rates to meet market demand. Anybody that's had Economics 101 knows that it's the market demand at that price, right? So uh, in the Prindle book that Jim and I were talking about earlier, he, he notes that there used to be this meeting that the Railroad Commission would have every year and they'd invite all the executives from the big oil companies who would get up and talk about the oil, excuse me, the Railroad Commission being the epitome of supporting free markets, all the time knowing they were supporting prices. Uh, they still have regular, they still have authority to do that. There have been suggestions that they should do that in certain ways. That's ridiculous. I have a lot of friends who are being hurt in the oil and gas business, so I have a lot of empathy for people who are losing their jobs or getting pay cuts or having to move, all of that. But those of us that chose careers in oil and gas knew that it was a high reward, high risk business. If you didn't know that, something didn't click with you. What and you so we're, it, that we're just seeing the downside of risk. Which I, I agree with Mark. Um, this industry is highs and lows, booms and busts. Uh, and it, they just, for me, the industry just doesn't seem to learn from their past. Uh, they see the big guys going in and a bunch of new companies start over and they all want to get in, but then you glut the market. So you produce more, the more you produce, you know the price is going to go lower. Supply and demand. The more you supply, the lower your price goes. So I think they got into, especially with the gas going down in Eagle Shell, because I'm, I'm, I'm down from that area. I know a lot of people that worked in the supportive uh, areas, whether they were actually on the fracking side or they're supplying the pipe or they were the welder or they were the ones transporting the, the fracking water elsewhere. And a lot of them are hurting. And I, I hate to see that, but that's what the industry does. 
they they bring in all these people saying, hey, this is going to go. And I think they predicted five years ago that this was going to be going for about 10, 15 years. But then everybody just got into the market and they exploded it. And then there's now people are just trying to make their ends meet, make sure they don't go too much into debt, make sure that um, th they're selling off their companies now. So, and, and all those people are going without um, – jobs and they don't know where to go, which I think if the Texas had a, was more supportive in the renewable energy, uh, we would have a place for those laid off people, those laid off workers to go. And uh, moving on a little bit, it's um, our, our, our current commissioners um, and, and for years have, have loved uh, railing against the, uh, the EPA. Um, there are so many um, legal battles and just rhetorical ba uh, battles between the Railroad Commission and the EPA, well, really the state of Texas and the EPA, but the Railroad Commission plays a major role in that. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Martina, first, um, is, it, is it productive? I mean, there are, and, and, and I think we kind of know where, where you fall on, on the specific issues, um, but part of this is this idea of the federal government shouldn't be telling Texas what to do. Um, wh what do you make of these, these, these battles between these agencies? The EPA is a necessary. It's very necessary. Uh, there is instances where government um, doesn't seem to have any common sense. So they overstep um, bounds in certain issues or certain cases where bureaucracy just ties, muddies, ties up or muddies the waters. But it, it, it isn't necessary because I've, I've worked in the construction industry. We have good contractors. We have bad contractors. And even the good ones make mistakes. There has to be someone there to oversee um, these kind of operations. Because, you know, I can go on a site and they're throwing trash in the, in the ditch or they're, they have uh, stuff that shouldn't be there. And they know that. They, they've done this. They're, they've been in the business for 20 years. They know what they should and shouldn't do. They know what the right process is. But, you know, the people get lazy. People get stressed out. And they do whatever they think they can get away with sometimes. So the EPA is necessary. But the Railroad Commission will say, well, we're already doing what they're, they're trying to do here. Um, and, and we don't need their oversight if we're protecting our resources. I, I find it very interesting that state government likes to say that local control is the best thing and that's what we need to do until a city decides to do something that they don't agree with. And we're referring to the city of Denton, I suppose. Um, Mark, Mark, what do you think about these, uh, these agency battles? Well, the last statement I would certainly agree with, with Martina about is, is that the more local the control, the better. And so uh, those of us that believe in more local control Obviously, uh, the EPA should be taking care of national issues, not issues that impact Texas. Now, as far as the Railroad Commission is concerned, uh, you know, this, this, is a, this is a fight between Texas and the federal government. Okay, I get that. But the best thing the Railroad Commission do is just take care of business. Let's just do our job, properly regulate the industry the way Texans want the industry to be regulated, and be done with it. Let the lawyers, let the politicians, let everybody else Let's make the Railroad Commission just a commission that takes care of the issue. We can spend a whole lot of time ginning up uh, 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 this war between us and the EPA, and, and it's an $85 million a uh, year regulatory agency. My goodness, that doesn't even pay for one good lawyer. So you're saying, you're saying that the agency should, should take care of its, it, itself, but it needs to... I basically changed the way that just you, you quit talking about this. Okay. The, 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 no, <laughs> not you. But I, th I think the commissioners should quit, should quit talking about this okay. issue because I think it, it's a wag the dog issue. It's to say, look, everything's fine, but because the EPA is the bad guys. See, I thought you were. Uh, I had a flashback to when I interviewed T Boone Pickens, and he told me to quit talking about something. <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm, he, I'm he actually told me to quit talking about the city of Denton, um, <laughs> but. Uh, um, so, so, so moving on, we, we, we've teased the issue pretty well in, in, in this, uh, the earthquake issue. Um, probably a lot of you saw the news, um, was it last week when the USGS came out with their first ever map of where um, places are more, most likely to get hit with man-made earthquakes. I mean, the, um, um, and, and as, as you may have read, um, these are not necessarily earthquakes from, from, from fracking, but, but earthquakes um, that uh, there, there have been earthquakes tied to uh, the drilling of uh, uh, disposal wells, the, the high pressure injection of waste, uh, liquid waste that comes, comes from the fracking um, process, the, the leftovers. 
Um, and uh, you know, anyone who's who's been in um, di certain areas of North Texas ha has probably felt some some small earthquakes. Um, not a lot of damage, if any damage, caused so far. There's also some earthquakes um, out in West Texas where fewer people are. Um, not as many in Texas as in Oklahoma where they've been shaking fiercely more than California and um, uh, um, have had some some bigger, somewhat damaging ones. Um, the Railroad Commission has taken a few actions on earthquakes, um, which has included hiring a seismologist um, and requiring that more information be submitted um, in, in certain areas near faults, um, um, and, and clarifying that it has authority to shut down wells if they find a link. Um, but the Railroad Commission has not actually come out and said, yes, we um, agree with the USGS and other researchers that that there is a definitive link in some cases um, between um, this man-made activity and earthquakes. Um, Martina, first, um, what do you think about the way the commission has handled this? Is ha Have their actions been, been enough? Um, what, what do they need to do? This issue is the reason I be wanted to run for railroad commission. I live in, I was living in Fort Worth and I kept hearing on the news about these earthquakes having, happening in Azle. And then I heard about a meeting that the citizens of Azle, the residents of Azle, had with the railroad commissioner. These people came after work, or they left work. They came to a meeting like this, and the railroad commissioner stood up and said, well, I know you all want to go home and go watch a Super Bowl, so I'm not going to take any questions. Now, you stated that there wasn't a lot of damage, but if it's my own personal home that is affected, that the foundation is broken, that my walls have been shaken, that I have cracks in my walls of no personal fault of my own, and I moved into an area not known for earthquakes, no one's helping me out, and that's a big problem for me. So I would have to, I know people that are in Azel that they're having to use their money to fix their houses, or they won't be able to sell them. They, their property values have gone down, which most of our um, most of our main, uh, I want to say, wealth comes from your home. Once you own your home, that's really your your main wealth. Most that's for most Texas citizens. Um, but the commission doesn't agree. They don't they don't think they need to fix anything because there's nothing that proves that those earthquakes were caused by fracking. Never mind that none of those earthquakes were prevalent in, in Texas until all these operations started happening. So I is there an answer though? I mean, is it, um, what, what, what should they be doing beyond maybe recognizing that this is a, an issue? I think the industry, I think the industry next, next needs to take some responsibility. They, get, they, they wanna say they've been fracking for hundreds of years, but not to this magnitude, not to the magnitude they have in the last five years not until um, our last vice president um, was able to get fracking passed, um, you know, having, t having it be uh, exempt from the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. So to say that it's, the industry really does take responsibility and so does the state. Whether, how that ends up happening, I think it depends on us forming some sort of committee with industry and government and citizens to figure out what is the best way. What do you think, Mark? Um, as, as Jim probably knows, I have been very critical of the Railroad Commission uh, on this issue. Uh, for a long time, the Railroad Commission denied there was any linkage between wastewater injection and earthquakes, even though we have known for at least 50 years that that's not true. Uh, and I have to admit, when I first heard the story as a petroleum engineer, I thought, really? And then I started looking into the science. You were asking earlier about why a petroleum engineer needs to be on the Railroad Commission. There's a reason. Because the other people on the Railroad Commission are not able to even understand the issues. There's a world-class seismologist that works at the University of Texas right within sort of walking distance of the, of the Railroad Commission who's been studying this issue for years and years and years. There's a clear linkage between earthquakes sometimes, somewhere. There's 7,500 wastewater injection wells in Texas, the number of places that have been associated with wastewater injection are a handful. So the issue you asked, Jim, which is, what do we do about it? Well, 
we do something other than, than the Potemkin Village that the Railroad Commission did. Hiring a seismologist is like, oh, we need to be seen to do something, so we'll hire somebody. All right? That's not necessary. Secondly, the regulations that they supposedly put in don't have any teeth because even though they supposedly do have the capability of controlling the injection well, they never have, even though there have been some cases where there was a clear linkage. And the most uh, example is the Azle earthquakes. There was actually a study done by SMU, University of Texas, USGS, world-class geoscientists that found that there were two wells, that at least one of them likely had some connection with the earthquakes near Azle. What's really interesting is that the earthquakes stopped there, and there's no doubt in my mind why they stopped, because there's a certain well that when the rate went up, the earthquake started, and when the rate went down, the earthquakes stopped. There's a particular well. There's no doubt in my mind that the operator of that well thought, you know what, we better change the rate back to the original value just because this might be a problem. And sure enough, it went, it went away. What that tells me is you don't have to necessarily shut in the wells in certain cases. Sometimes you can just make sure that the rates stay at a certain level. At the very least, if a, pers if a company that has a wastewater injection well knows that they are liable to get that well shut in because there is a reasonable connection, a reasonable connection with earthquakes, they're going to make sure they do their, s their, their risk analysis, they're going to do their geology, they're going to get some insurance if necessary and put the well somewhere else if that's what needs to be happened. So the Railroad Commission needs to be a lot more proactive. And I hate to say this because the Texans seem to love their oil, the, the Railroad Commission, but actually Oklahoma is doing better in this case. They have actually done a lot to take care of the problem. They have a lot more seismically active area. It's a lot more serious problem up there than it is in Texas. Yeah. And they've actually been far more proactive than our Railroad Commission. And, and I, I wonder if you think, it, is that partially because the earthquakes have been so much stronger? Oklahoma did take a while to come out and, like, the governor to actually recognize the link, but do, do you feel like the if the earthquakes grow in magnitude here? There would, be, there would be a much bigger outcry. There's no doubt in my mind that because the earthquakes near ASIL actually decreased down to the very low level, that the public outcry uh, went down with it, and for obvious reasons. Um, now, actually, I'll make, let me make one more observation about Martina, about people wanting their homes fixed. You know what? The companies that do those wells, the, the well that's probably a culprit is owned by a very big company. They would prefer just to come in and fix people's homes, but they're afraid they're going to have to do 50,000 of them. And so that's the problem that, that they're going to, that they want to have zero liability because of the, the legal system that we're in. Do you have anything you wanted to? Well, for me, that would be an easy uh, fix is that what you do is that you do a pre-construction or a pre-operation assessment. The area that you think is going to be affected, I, I, whether, you know, and it doesn't have to be an arbitrary number, you go in and address, you video, you uh, record, you assess the current conditions, and then if things start coming, happening, you can always go back to that record. So, but yet we haven't heard anything yet from either the commission or the company, whether any of this is going to be resolved. So I want to pivot to um, one more issue, and then um, we'll go to questions because uh, we're, we're getting towards question time. Um, so so if, if you have questions, uh, start formulating them now. Um, but, but I did want to talk about um, another role, the, the Railroad Commission, which is uh, involved in, in pipelines. Uh, the Railroad Commission does not actually route pipelines. Actually, no state agency does, but it does, it does uh, uh, regulate pipeline safety and, and, and so forth. That's where, where it's taken more action. But there's, there are a lot of interesting property rights issues that are sort of in flux right now in Texas when it comes to pipelines and eminent domain. Um, and there's this whole process of uh, the Railroad Commission categorizes, uh, can um, categorize certain pipelines as common carriers, um, um, which, which means that they're basically open for public use and then would be eligible for uh, um, uh, eminent domain. Um, but uh, the, the Railroad Commission basically says, you know, we're categorizing these, these pipelines, um, but, but uh, we're letting the courts decide whether they're eligible for these categories. And it, it's, it's created a lot of confusion when it, when it comes to landowners trying to, um, you know, protest pipelines that they don't want through the property or they want better deals. I'm sorry, it's a little bit convoluted, but 
Um, I, I, I wanted to ask Martina, since the Railroad Commission really has tried to, as much as it can, wash its hands of the eminent domain issue, um, do you feel like that's a good thing to leave that to the courts, or should it be taking more of a role in, in, in these disputes? Well, I certainly think it should be more than a little box that you check that you're going to be a common carrier. Um, there is, I think, the applications for common carrier, uh, for the permits to be able to put the pipelines in, I really do think it should be on the industry, on the um, energy company to prove that they are going to be a common carrier. So, I mean, they use that as, uh, to be able to use the common carrier, um, you're providing the public use. Well, most of this is just going from one refinery to another or one site to the refinery. The public never gets any use out of it. So people are, lo are losing their rights and their usage to land that they have owned for centuries or have been in the family for generations. And I don't think that's right. I think it is one core value of Texas is to be able to keep your private property rights. It's, it's your land and no one should be able to come and say, I can put what I want there. Because they're using eminent domain, which is a public right, for private profit. And, and that's not right. And so the Texas Supreme Court in, in 2011 um, did come and say, just checking the box is not good enough. Um, in, in a case that's actually still going on in, in the Supreme Co Texas Supreme Court again on another issue, it's, a, it's really wonky and fascinating. You could read about it at the Texas Tribune. Um, but uh, the, so, so it, it's ruled that the, the box enough, you know, is, is, is not proof enough that it's um, a common carrier. And the Railroad Commission came and um, they created new rules that said that pipeline companies must submit additional information that's supposedly supposed to help show um, that uh, a pipeline could be a common carrier, which includes like maybe contracts and things like that with other companies. But the, the commission is still saying that we're not, uh, you know, officially granting eminent domain. We're just categorizing it for our own use. Um, Mark, do you think, what do you think of that? Sh should the Railroad Commission be involved? Well, right now they're not uh, statutorily. And the case you're referring to is, is, is very important. W one of the things I really objected to, the, the just before the last election, maybe a month before the latest Republican was elected, they actually um, put out these regulations which made people think they were getting control of it. They weren't. All it was was a little bit more information. The, the Railroad Commission actually has no statutory authority to grant eminent domain, and that's what the Supreme Court unanimously said. Our very Republican conservative Supreme Court said the Railroad Commission has no authority to grant eminent domain. The problems at the legislature, the, the threshold for a common carrier pipeline is extremely low. They only have to actually offer to carry third party product. They don't actually have to carry it. In my view, if you're going to do anything for common carriers, they ought to be 100% common carrier, or at least maybe 50%. But, and, and of course, we libertarians, if you want to get libertarians fired up about something, talk about either the Second Amendment or eminent domain. You'll, and, and maybe if you talk about eminent domain, the Second Amendment will come up. Um, <laughs> that, um, but particularly when eminent domain is used, as Martinez said, said, to transfer property from one private interest to another. The, the, um, the Kelo case that was most recent that the Supreme Court ruled on upholding the ability of, of local entities to do that was vehemently opposed by the more conservative uh, Supreme Court justices. And I think they were totally right because they said it hurts those less well-off the most and effectively the person who gets the property gets a whole lot more benefit than the public. So it's bad enough that eminent domain is used for schools and roads and hospitals but when it's used for a pipeline, that's crazy. In Texas, we've got pipelines everywhere. It's hard for me to believe there are not some alternative routes along roads and existing pipelines where these pipelines could be. Why don't they use them? Frankly, it's because we engineers like to draw straight lines. And they, there is no downside to doing the shortest possible route. And the legislature is going to have to do that. 
What I don't understand is why the railroad commissioners aren't telling the legislature, you need to do that. It's an executive position. The railroad commissioner is not appointed by the governor. It is equivalent to the governor. It answers to the voters. It's an executive position. He has a role to tell the legislature, here's what we think you should change laws to do. And that would be one we absolutely need to address. And working with local government, once you get a e gas easement on your property, it's gone. You have no use of it. You can't plant a tree. You can't put your own water line through it. I, we, I've dealt with city projects where we couldn't put a sewer line over it. And the, the pipeline was 20 feet down. No, I mean, it, it, these gas easements are just out of, they're out of control. And they don't pay market value. They pay you what they think, what they want to pay you. And they could shortchange neighbors. You know, one guy might be getting $1,000 per foot, my guy might be getting 50 bucks per foot. There was a recent hearing at the legislature um, just maybe, what, a week ago or so, yes. and um, uh, you heard some horror stories. Everybody who exercised eminent domain got up and said, oh, we're doing fine, we give them good offers, and everybody who was on the other side said BS. And there was some really bad horror stories about Mar what Martinez just saying about the amount of money that's given. It's, it's uh, you're a, you, you lose if you're a landowner. All right, um, let's open it up to questions. And we have plenty, right? Here's the deal, whoa. Uh, once again, for those of you who weren't here, we need you to, you, well, you don't have to identify yourself since this is a libertarian convention, but we'd prefer that you give your name, any affiliation, <laughs> and please make your question in the form of a question. Patrick, I'm going to start with you. And don't take the microphone from me. I'll hand it, I'll hold it. All right. I, I'm Pat Dixon. Uh, the question is, how do you elevate this race among the voters to get past just the straight ticket option and get people really interested in this race? Uh, it, it's worse than the straight ticket problem. I, I, I heard the uh, uh, most recent uh, railroad commissioner said he did some polling last time and only 5% of voters know that the Railroad Commission regulates oil and gas. So regardless of the straight ticket voting, this is an oil and gas state. You could love oil and gas and you ought to care about the Railroad Commission. You could hate oil and gas and you ought, ought to care about the Railroad Commission, yet only 5% of voters know about what the commission does. I blame changing of the name. I think that's critical. I suspect Martina alluded to this earlier, why it didn't pass the last time was because it will take a constitutional amendment and voters are gonna go, how long have you guys been lying to us? That's exactly how voters are gonna feel when they find out what the Railroad Commission really does. And, and I don't, you know, other than to continue to talk about it as much as we can, Jim talks about it a lot, all right? He does, and uh, there are some news outlets, but apparently it's, the word's not getting out. It's like asking when, how can we get more press for Libertarians and Green Party? It, it just really all starts at grassroots. Every single person that you talk to, you need to mention it. Every single person that I run into, I ask them if they're registered to vote. Um, it's the same thing. I am in a different little, a different little place since I work for a uh, public entity and I really can't use my position, but you guys can. Just put it out there. Hey, do you guys know what the Railroad Commission does? Just put it out there. Okay, here we go. Granted that there may be a correlation between injection and small earthquakes, have you considered challenging the assumption that those small earthquakes are actually bad? Because earthquakes are releasing stress, and it's much better to have a series of small earthquakes than let the stress build up and have a large earthquake later at some other point in time. Yeah, yeah, technically that's a point well taken, and I've gotten into arguments with several of my friends about that. But it's pretty hard to convince somebody who lives nearby and their house shakes and their sheetrock breaks that that was really a good thing. And so I, even though you're probably correct, um, but you may be preventing an earthquake, you know, 10,000 years from now. And so it's a little hard for people to really get their head around it. The, up near Azel, um, this was an area that hadn't had an earthquake in hundreds and hundreds of years. And so now you have people that live nearby and, and they're scared, they, they get scared. Um, perhaps they shouldn't be. I, I grew up in California, so an earthquake was no big deal. 
but if you if you live in Tarrant County where you haven't had earthquakes your whole life, it's a little scary, and so that's the problem. I, I, I kind of consider earthquakes induced by human activity to be a trespass. Um, you know, there's actually laws against using seismic waves to look for oil and gas under your property without your permission, but it's kind of okay to cause an earthquake that rattles your house. I agree with Mark. It's man-made. If we know this is what we're doing, then why don't we stop it? I mean, have you? I was in a the movie theater when the earthquake happened. I thought the world was going to fall down. So yeah, it's not a good thing to go through. And if we're doing it, we just we need to stop it. Hi, I'm Bill Kelsey from Austin, and uh, it sure is refreshing to uh, hear you after hearing the orange-haired howler monkey and the uh, horror of Babylon. It, it's I hope I look forward to the day when. Greens and libertarians are debating instead of these other old parties. Now, um, my question is for Martina. Could you, uh, we, we know that uh, what's really at stake here is ballot access. Both of you need to get 5% in order for your party to stay on the b uh, ballot, our respective parties. Uh, could you expound on What's happening with Bernie Sanders? I think he sucked a lot of life out of the Greens because they're all, uh, Rand Paul failed to do that with us, so we're still strong. But in your case, uh, Bernie Sanders, if he doesn't get the nomination, are you going to get more votes? Or if he does get the nomination, is that going to ruin the Greens in, in, in Texas? What, what do you have to say about that? Well, it would have been nice if Bernie had ran for Green, but then Bernie wouldn't have gotten the media attention that he has. Um, I think ultimately, even though he might get the popular vote, I don't think the establishment will be willing to give him the nomination. I think we've been seeing that. They're trying to sabotage him. And there's a lot of people that were disenchanted with the political process that started to believe again. And they will be seriously upset. Um, so they will be doing something that would upset the establishment, which is voting green, or maybe even libertarian. So I think Bernie's a good thing. If he wins, I think he's a better choice among what you have right now. I think Jill Stein's a better choice, but I would think your, you think your candidate's a better choice. Um, so we'll agree to disagree on that. But yeah, I think Bernie will, I think he'll bring a lot of life into our, both our parties. I have a question about eminent domain. <coughs> you were talking about uh, a private company using eminent domain, a private uh, property owner using an eminent domain to take property from another private uh, owner. Uh, there's been a recent uh, addition to the Texas Bill of Rights that is supposed to deal with that, uh, is supposed to at least partially uh, 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 prohibit that. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the details of it, but do you think that um, um, that would uh, affect the, um, the, the pipeline problem with eminent domain. I think what you're referring to are some changes in regulations that actually attempted to make sure the offers were better. Uh, but I, I'm not sure it, had, it did anything in particular to, to actually stop or, or increase the hurdles. To me, the biggest issue with pipelines is you've got to increase the requirements about what it takes to be an eminent domain pipeline. If it's a private pipeline, they are not allowed to use eminent domain if it's a totally private pipeline. And therefore, they have to make deals with all the landowners. It's not a problem, right? If they make a deal, they offer you enough money, we'll keep your property, you're, you're a happy camper. Um, but it's this case is of the common carriers, and there's a lot more to be done. It, there's, it's just, it's just a, and it's not just pipelines, by the way. It's uh, power lines and, uh, uh, and lots of other things as well. Yes, definitely. We, the Texas legislator and the Rail Commission has a lot of work to do on this because there is no reason for them to be taking your private property away from you. Uh, hello. My, my name is James Holland. Uh, I was wondering if there's any regulations you believe that are causing harm and what would you do to minimize that harm that they cause? Regulations that are causing harm. Well, probably the, uh, I'll have to get down in the weeds just a little bit, but the, one of the things the Railroad Commission does 
is specify well spacing, allowable well spacing. This falls under the conservation idea, and it really is more actually about protecting competing uh, property interests. If, if Martina and I have property next door to each other, uh, I, don't want, I want to make sure she doesn't produce all my oil. And so they have rate and, and spacing requirements. Um, they're coming into conflict with property owner, uh, mineral rights owners because their contracts often require you to keep a lease to drill to railroad commission uh, spacing. And so you've got a, a situation where the oil companies want that spacing to be big because they want very few wells to hold acreage and a mineral rights owner wants it to be small because they want you to give up your acreage. And there, there's a big fight coming, especially right now as the downturn. And the Railroad Commission has been totally behind things on how to deal with that issue. Um, there's some other things around um, what are called allocation wells that uh, we'd have to have a private conversation about uh, that are causing a lot of heartburn a, a lot of people. And it really is things inside the industry that I think are the biggest problem. For me, the biggest problem is register and also um, this, if you drilled a well 100, year, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, you are not, even if you didn't find anything, you abandoned the well, you took your little, your toys home and went someone else. Now you can go back and you don't fall under any current regulation. You fall under whatever was in place back when you first drilled that well. And I think we need to be able to use current standards that are safer and more uh, acceptable to surface property owners. All right, I've got this, and then I'll take one more. We have time for one more question after this. Dan? Dan Boggs, Eckerd County, fresh from the heart of the beast. What would you do, either one of you, about the waiver to Rule 37 that allows oil producers basically to take your minerals if you own them against your will? Nobody should take anybody's minerals against their will, period. Um, and I know what you're referring to. It's the allocation well thing that we were talking about briefly, which says if, if you don't want to lease your land, it, it's, it's sort of a forced unitization. Uh, what's really interesting in Texas is that we have, we have as a state resisted a, a forced unitization, forced pooling, yet that's effectively what that does. And, and it's clearly a sop to the oil companies you should be allowed not to lease your land if you so wish. Agreed. I mean, there's no reason for state government to be deciding what you do with your own land. It's the basic right as a citizen. There is no reason at all. Okay, last question. Uh, good evening. My name is Nathan. I'm a delegate for Libertarian uh, State Convention here. And Mark, earlier you talked about how, of course, you have a lot of empathy for some friends that you have in the oil and gas industry right now um, because the industry is struggling with the downturn. Um, I'm wondering if, you, if those same friends in the industry have empathy for you in the positions that maybe you take. In other words, how, it, how would you convince people who are involved in the industry to get on your side? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's one I struggle with a little bit because uh, most people who work in my industry uh, support uh, the Railroad Commission uh, for a couple of reasons. One is mostly they're for their daily operations, it, they don't make much difference. Uh, but the other one being there were some real problems the Railroad Commission solved in terms of competing mineral rights uh, decades ago, and, and it did sort of uh, do a valuable service in protecting people's uh, property rights. Um, but what, what I'm finding is that I, I made a comment earlier about this big company person who said, you know, we really need to have a commission that Texans trust. And I guarantee you, and when, when I went around the state last time, uh, and, and as I'm starting to this go around, if you talk to folks and you tell them about the Railroad Commission and they're not into oil and gas and they know anything at all, they hate the Railroad Commission. It's not, oh, they're kind of doing okay. No, they hate them. And it, they're perceived as being um, beholden to the oil and gas industry. Even if they're not, they're perceived that way. And so I think people in the industry who really are concerned about that, 
understand that moving the Railroad Commission to something that is less beholden, in fact, should be not beholden, doesn't mean it has to be against the oil and gas business. It means it needs to be neutral, as every government agency should be. And, and I think there's people that believe that, but if you talk to Texoga or TIPRO or the big industry organizations, they'll have this knee jerk of no, 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 no. If you're against the Railroad Commission, you're against us. And it, I, I don't think it's a general view out there in the industry. Well, with that, um, I just wanted to thank you all for, for coming and, and hope, hope, hope you learned a little bit. Um, could we give our um, guests another round of applause? All right, and let's thank our moderator as well. Great job tonight. All right, we got a little bit of a break happening here.